I'm Ben Melnicki. I will be the moderator today. I am product and regulatory counsel here at Cross River Bank. Uh, Cross River Bank is a New Jersey state chartered institution um, that was founded in 2008. And we provide embedded financial uh, solutions to customers. Um, and our, our core uh, premise is based around regulatory compliance and making sure that our product offerings and our customers and uh, the services that we provide um, are compliant with applicable law, rule, and regulation. Uh, I'm joined today first by Simon Taylor, who is the head of content and strategy at Sardine, and Emily Pernick, who's the head of product at Orem. First, uh, Simon, um, if you don't mind just giving a brief, real quick introduction on what on both Sardine and yourself, what you do there, it'll be uh, greatly helpful. Yeah, uh, so Team is a platform for fraud and compliance, the world's best fraud and compliance team that you hire as an API. Uh, we help with everything from account onboarding fraud to ACH funding fraud through the card, uh, account takeover, all the way through to SAR reporting uh, and anti-money laundering obligations. About three years old, Series B company uh, based out of the US. Uh, my job there is um, largely as a marketing function and being the resident British guy. So happy to be here. And we're happy to have you. Emily, uh, if you mind giving us a little brief introduction, it'd be helpful. Yeah, thanks, Ben. Uh, my name is Emily Pernak. I am the head of product at Forum. Um, currently, Orem is the, we provide the simplest API for fast and reliable payment. Our customers are able to integrate to a unified API in about two weeks um, and get access to all payment rails, including ACH, CMB, ACH, RTP, FedNow, Wires, and more. So thank you, Crossover, for having me. We're excited to have you both here. I think just everything you talked about right there is is a, is a good segue. Um, before we begin, I, I just want to tell our, our attendees, registrants, uh, if you have questions, you can please go ahead and submit them. Uh, we're going to be leaving some time at the end to make sure that we can get to all of your questions or as many as we can. So uh, with that, I mean, uh, I guess I'll start off with, with uh, Emily. Can you tell us uh, a little about Orem and uh, more about, uh, I think, your, your role and I, I think uh, how you make the company a success? Just a little bit more detail. Yeah, but sure. Um, I will say um, I'm very lucky and grateful to be on an amazing team. I do nothing here. I just lead the product team. Um, so the product team is really responsible for listening to customers, right? Paying attention to what's happening in the market and building out the best possible product um, for our customers. So we have, we've been in market about a year and a half with our money movement um, API it's grown significantly and we're really excited about adding net new features and products to um, our suite. But that's what I'm responsible for here at, uh, at Orem. And again, I do nothing except for help the product team build the product roadmap. That's great. So at Orem, how do you guys think about fraud? I think that's just a, a good segue. I'll just, let, let's just keep going on it. What, what do you guys think about fraud? Well, just give me a little bit of context. Yeah, so at Orm, we are really focused on faster payments. And I think there's a common misconception that faster payments equals faster fraud. That could be the case in some in some situations, but we're trying to make it not that way. Um, so Orem takes a very proactive approach to fraud. Um, we ourselves are not a fraud uh, provider. However, we partner with the best in class in the industry to make sure we're constantly monitoring on the back end, um, have best in class processes, systems, et cetera. Um, but we take, again, a very proactive approach. So if we identify anything in the end-to-end -end transfer or payment flow, we're on top of it. We have our operations team reaching out to customers. Sometimes it's false positive, sometimes not. Um, but we generally don't let things go too, too uh, far and, and leverage, again, our partners in the industry to make sure we're constantly monitoring and staying on top of it. That's very, thank you for that. Very, very helpful. And I think, you know, what's, what's interesting, both Orem and, and Sardine, you're on the cutting edge, I think, in terms of you know, technology and, and helping, you know, to combat fraud. So I guess, Simon, I'll just turn it over to you. What are your thoughts? What is, what are, how, how do you think about fraud, both personally and what is Sardine? Uh, that's a big question. Uh, <laughs> yeah. How do I think about fraud? Uh, I, let's, let's zoom out even further to economic crime. Um, because, um, frankly, 
Uh, I think there was an estimate by the UN that on an annual basis, uh, about 200,000 people are human trafficked into Myanmar um, in order to commit scams. Uh, the losses to scammers and authorized push payment fraud are up nearly 3x in the past two years. Um, so I think about it as a scourge on society when nobody wins. Um, and I think about it as a thing that traditionally the way we would prevent it is by uh, sort of this idea of uh, stopping transactions, adding friction. And that's not wrong. That's a really good thing. If we see something and we think it's fraud, we should reject that. But the problem is, <laughs> in the world of payments, we are more likely to have a false positive than a false negative. If the false positives, when I broke into the payments industry <laughs> longer than I want to admit ago, 15, 20 years ago, was a, a good performance was 10 to 1. So you are penalizing 10 good customers to catch one bad one. That's bad. That's really not good. So the the how I think about fraud is everybody loses unless we get better. And how I think about it at Sardine is fraud and risk are fundamentally data science problems. If I can get more data, if it can be more fine-grained, then I can see more than just the transaction, then I can start to do much more sophisticated AI much more sophisticated machine learning. And what that allows me to do is let more good customers get on with their life. I might even be able to remove friction from them at onboarding. I might even be able to let them pass without uh, 3D secure or verified by Visa because I'm really confident in them. I might even be able to uh, let them do things like uh, what Orin does which is to pre-fund uh, an ACH payment, to make a payment feel like it's happening in real time. That's incredible if I'm able to get my risk model good. So everybody wins if we get better data. So that's how I think about fraud is it's a scourge on society. Uh, frankly, it's funding the worst things in the world, but we need better data to be able to go deal with it. And the way I think about starting to manage that is as a data science problem. Thanks, Simon. So, I, I mean, look, we're, we're talking about, I think, RTP, faster payments, Fed now. So I guess it's a good question. Emily, I'll pose it to you. Uh, you know, what are some emerging threats in, in financial technology that people should know about? What, what's what's sort of, you know, top of mind for both Orm and, and what should what should everyone be, really be thinking about right now? Yeah, I think. Um, no, another big question. Sorry, but. No. but these are big questions, Ben. We got it. Um, I, I know we talk a lot about like online financial fraud, and I'll let Simon touch on that. Um, but there's also, and we're seeing a ton of social engineering fraud. Um, and what I mean by that is um, people at a bar, right? A woman's intoxicated. A man asks for her number. He takes the phone and Venmo's or Cash Apps himself $500, right? And there's really no recourse for that. Venmo has since and Cash App has since added some controls there, but we are seeing additional social engineering fraud coming um, both on the peer to peer side and also Zelle, right? So there has been some additional protections that Zelle has added. Um, I don't know if y'all have used Zelle, but when you send anyone money, they're like, are you sure you want to do this? Are you sure? Are you triple sure? Right? So there are have been some additional controls added there. Um, but we have seen in a bit of an uptick in the social engineering scams, and those can really range. Those can range from international romance scams to, again, like bar scams with Venmo um, and everything in between. We are, as Orem, as a payments provider, right, we are not in control of our customers' front end experience. They are in full control of that. So we would never ask them to add additional friction. However, we will absolutely provide guidelines and suggestions and advice on what we've seen work and not work in the industry um, to help protect everyone and, and ultimately make a better, a better fintech industry as a whole. I, can Thanks. I just jump on that point? Sorry, Benjamin. Absolutely. I think it's such, such a great point about friction. Um, so I, I often like to joke that um, because I'm from the UK, um, I'm the ghost of RTP future. Um, I've seen this movie. We've had RTP since 2005. And one of the reasons, um, you know, when I first joined Sardine, uh, I started saying faster payments equals faster fraud is because we have evidence of it in the UK. 
Uh, we've got 15 years of evidence, um, but it's not really fraud that's happening. To, uh, Emily used the word scams in social engineering. The ability with RTP to move money and it to be gone when it's authorized by the user is very different to the cards model where I have the chargeback or even with ACH where I had two days to kind of issue a return and figure out what happens around that. If the, the money is settled and the money is moved, it's a completely different ball game. So that's that's where that sort of uh, phrase comes from. But again, I come back to if I'm going to stop that, I need to see before the transaction. So many of our fraud controls were implemented on the transaction itself. The transaction's happening. Oh, uh, is it you know so going to a bank account that we know about? Like, what do we know about the transaction? Actually, what do we know about that device? Where have we seen that device before, before the transaction even comes in? What was it doing when it was uh, logging in? What other transactions has it made recently? Has that device been transacting? You know, can we use open banking data to go see how it's been performing historically? And that's where the data enrichment becomes so, so crucial for preventing ACH fraud. The more data I can get before the transaction, the more confident I can be to either A, remove some of that friction, or B, tell my clients, you might want to add some friction here. You might even want to hold this payment whilst you put it for a manual review. And that is all about being you know, a scalpel, not a machete. You want to be super fine. You want to be super accurate. You want to be super close to it. Uh, that, I want to stay with stay with you for a second, Simon. And uh, you know, I want to talk about some of the work that Sardine's sure. doing. And and uh, just for a moment, full disclosure. I mean, Sardine is a customer of Cross River. For those who are listening in, so should should have said that at the beginning. But um, you know, just curious, how are companies like Sardine? Can you tell us a little about the work that you're doing around uh, specifically faster payments and how it's helping consumers and business uh, to the extent you're able to just go into a little bit of detail uh, on that value proposition and, and the work that you're able to provide. Yeah, with faster payments specifically, a lot of our Specific. effort focuses on detecting scams, uh, frankly. Social engineering scams are prevalent across the industry, especially around el elderly targeting. Um, let's take the fake investment advisor. So a lot of our clients are in the uh, investment industry. We have a lot of clients in the neobanking industry. And they will see a person uh, of an elderly generation register for an account. And they're registering with their real uh, driver's license, real identity. The identity is not being stolen on the dark web. This looks like a real person. So as far as that uh, fintech company or as far as that investment app was concerned, a real customer registered and they tried to buy some stocks. They tried to sell them and it moved on. And it looks absolutely fine until they get a call complaining, hey, I lost my life savings. And you're like, hang on a second. What, what happened? Uh, that's and, and you know that this person's for real. You can hear it in the customer support calls. It's horrific what you, what you have to deal with. So the way we start to detect that is we can look for things that you might not be obvious. Let's just take the uh, fake investment advisor. What a fake investment advisor will do is they will identify through phishing and through scams, uh, you know, targeting SMSs as well. Uh, hey, there's an investment opportunity. You want to get into gold. You want to get into treasury bills. Like you can absolutely do it. Now's the perfect time to buy. We've got an amazing deal for you. You don't want to miss out. And so what this person does, what the victim does, is start to build a relationship over the phone. Uh, people of a certain age tend to trust a person over the phone. And so what you notice if you can see on the device is, huh, there's been a lot of conversations with this one phone number over a period of time. That's strange. Um, and there are certain, and after that conversation happened, they began signing up for this new service. Here's another thing that often happens. A person of a certain age may not be particularly comfortable using a digital application or service. So they might need some help. And one of the things scammers are great at is coaching people on digital. They would have a great second career in helping the uh, older generations go digital. They're so good at it. Because what they'll also do is if you're really stuck and they can't guide you over the phone, is they'll ask you for screenshots. So if you detect that screenshots are happening, that's particularly helpful. And if you don't get that, then they'll ask you to install some remote desktop software like Citrix or AnyDesk or TeamViewer. And so Sardine can detect all of that. We'll look for the regular phone calls, active calls in session. 
We'll look for screenshots near a transaction or an onboarding event. And we'll also look for uh, any remote takeover software. And if that's happened during onboarding, if that's happened during a payment, then that is an extremely high risk signal before money moves, before any type of payment. And the same works for uh, you know, Zelle scams and, and, and everything of that nature, because that's usually the money out. So if you apply our software, no matter where you apply it, we're seeing it. And the more the sardine network grows, the more effective we become at doing that. Thanks. So, Simon, you know, you give, you've given me a, something to think about. I, I want to take a step back because, you know, the, the concept of fraud is, is, is it, just the word itself is frightening. Fraud has the same letter as, as frightening. And, and I, I want to just sort of break it down a little bit. So I'm wondering, Emily, you know, with, with consumers, for the average consumer, you think about, you know, fraud and you think there's a, there's a villain, a victim and, and maybe a hero. But a lot of people don't understand truly, you know, what happens behind the scenes and and just the, the key players uh, and the different roles that are in the ecosystem when it comes to combating, identifying and combating fraud. So if you could just give us a, a brief primer, an overview, at least how you see different roles in the ecosystem, I, I think it would be helpful for the listeners. Yeah, absolutely. So we think about it kind of there's three pillars. Right. When a payment is sent, there's like a big fraud pillar, there's a big identity pillar, and there's a big payments pillar. Right. And you kind of need all three to work seamlessly to create a successful instant transaction. Right. That's not going to bounce back because of any fraud related issue. And within those three pillars, right, no one party is doing all of those perfectly. And that's why, like, in, in this fintech ecosystem, like, we all have to partner with each other because. Or we, we do payments, we cannot do everything. And we don't want to do everything, right? We want to be the expert in payments. We'll let Sardine, we'll let SoCure, we'll let Alloy, right? A lot of our, our friendlies in the market focus on different aspects of the payment. And there are tons of challenges right now, right? And there's a lot of challenges being solved with financial infrastructure. And that's why personally I'm in the infrastructure space because I think the problems are just so vast and there's so much to be solved. But again, no one single party is gonna solve everything. And it's important to acknowledge that, right? Because I think when when um, developers and, and founders come and wanna create a, a FinTech, whether that's a neobank or a lending platform or whatever it might be, right? You really need to be I would say very um, intentional and specific on, on how you're building out that tech stack to make sure A, you're protecting yourself, but B, you're not overcomplicating it. And C, you're not choosing one provider to do everything again, because like we're all not experts in each other's field. Um, so I think that's important to acknowledge. And, and again, like we, we partner with others in the industry because we we are not the fraud experts and, and that's okay. Um, and uh, like I said, Orem doesn't explicitly fight fraud, but we do work closely with partners and our customers to ensure we're enabling fraud protections and giving advice on fraud protections, introducing them to partners to help with fraud monitoring, et cetera. Um, so that's kind of how I think about the ecosystem. And it, it is very complex and there is a lot of problems to be solved out there. Um, but again, that's like why we're all in financial infrastructure and that's why we're tackling the hard problems. Um, so we can create a better financial um, financial um, platform, right? So that neobanks and other companies coming online can have an easier experience when they launch their product. Uh, That's a great point. Uh, yeah, it's a great, great points. So I, I want to stick with another F word here. And it's a clean F word again. It's a, we were saying fraud. Simon, uh, friction. I heard you talking about friction. You, you, you mentioned it. Um, yeah, I think it, it could be understood in various different ways, but let's stick again with faster payments or however you want to go. But when we talk about fraud and friction and, and fraud being meaning less friction for, for your customers, what, what do we mean? Can you expand on that a little bit? Um, it, it's just another term I think it would be helpful to sort of break down and digest a little bit further. Yeah. So, you know, when you go to make a payment sometimes and you get the MasterCard secure code, like we're going to send you an SMS, please enter that PIN or you're trying to sign up for a service and you're like, oh my goodness, this is taking forever. Friction is the enemy of conversion. So if I want to be able to, if I'm a FinTech company or a neobank, what do I want? I want as many customers to get through conversion as possible. And I want them to be paying as soon as possible because if they convert and they pay, they're more likely to stay active. We know that from product, it's a wonderful thing. 
same with if I'm a merchant, if I'm in e-commerce, I want conversion. I want people to hit checkout and not have any friction from getting in the way. Heck, even if they don't have enough money sometimes. Is there a right kind of friction? Dodgy, apologies. That's okay. Is, is there a right or wrong kind of friction? Is, is there is there are there sort of rules of the road, you think? Or, or is it? Uh, yeah, is it... a little bit of friction can be a good thing. Um, I think sometimes friction can build trust. Uh, let's say uh, your bank is going to call you and they have a feature where you can see in the app that they're actually on the phone with you, that it's really your bank. You're going through an extra step, but you know you're not being scammed. That's a trust builder. Sometimes, uh, that, especially when you've been scammed in the past, that little bit of friction can be a very, very good thing from a consumer perspective. But also from a, a merchant perspective, from a fintech perspective, if I'm trying to onboard these customers and I own and I let everybody in, including the bad guys, then I'm going to end up with the regulator breathing down my neck. I'm going to end up with lots of declines uh, when somebody tries to use my card because everybody else is going to see a lot of fraud came from that one fintech company over there. So we're going to decline that. And then I build a terrible user experience overall. So a little bit of friction applied in the right place at the right time can not only build trust with your users, it can improve your conversion, which sounds like the most counterintuitive thing in the known universe. But I'd rather have trust and higher conversion, but I'd rather focus it on the actual positive instances of fraud rather than the false positives. And that comes back to it fundamentally being a data problem. I need more data from as many sources. Um, I loved what Emily was saying uh, about working with all of the fintech companies. I really do think we are a school of fish. Like sardines react better together, right? Like we, we need all of our partners. We have at least 30 different partners under the hood that we're working with on a day-to-day -day basis to get the best possible data to provide the best possible service. So that's such a crucial point. So a little bit of friction can be a good thing and it can build trust if it's applied the right way. I agree. So I wanna, yeah, I was gonna ask you, Emily, do you have, do you have anything you'd like to add to? Yeah, I, I agree on like the right amount of friction. I remember when a lot of the apps rolled out face recognition Right. So before you you buy a thousand dollars worth of Bitcoin, let's just check your face or your fingerprint. And it's like, absolutely. Why didn't we do that before? There's like a lot of things that that apps have added. Right. That have been around for a while. But that's like the perfect amount of friction because I'm like, thank you for checking. Right. That this is my face. Thank you for checking. This is my thumb thumbprint. Um, I think Venmo. Right. Thank you for checking the last four digits of the, the recipient's phone number. Um, because I think Simon, you made a great point. That that builds trust. The wrong amount of friction is um asking for too much information. The wrong amount of friction is asking for information on multiple screens, right? So you're clicking through adding information potentially. Um, so I think that it's a careful balance, but I do think a lot of the neobanks, a lot of the apps have made significant progress in adding the right amount of friction that build trust. Soup so Sardine calls it fast lane and slow lane. Uh, which is um, if I have a super low risk customer, they're in the fast lane. Um, if I have a super sort of high risk customer, they end up in the slow lane. So I want to not shift gears entirely, but but sort of stay along this this path. Uh, near and dear to me is compliance, compliance and risk. Um, so I, I want to talk about how you know in back traditional financial services, and I think in more um, more earlier business models, we would manage financial institutions, regulated entities would manage compliance and risk, you know, through, through just raw data ingestion, um, manual reports. So I want to talk about API technology, you know, API really integration. And I, I guess, you know, how, how do you use API technology to manage compliance and, and risk generally? Uh, Emily, I'll, I'll start with you, I guess, just if you want to take that. Yeah. So, um, I would say that again, Orem partners with some of the best in business to ensure that we are running compliance um, as effectively and as efficiently for our customers as possible. I think API technology has overall made the entire end-to-end -end process significantly better. And why I think that's true is because it's faster. And a lot of times, I'll speak for Orem here, right? If we're sending a payment 
It's not at the batch level, it's at the single API call level. And so no longer are we saying, okay, at the end of the day, we're sending this batch file out, right? And once it's gone, it's gone. And if there's a fraudulent payment in there, it's gonna affect the whole file, right? No longer those days, we, we send the minute we get a transfer in, um, we're running fraud rules and, and checks and then sending that transfer directly to the bank via API. And so I think the API ecosystem has made things extremely um, fast, but in the right way, right? And, and kind of reducing the amount of batch processes we're doing, whether that's on compliance, whether that's on fraud, whether that's on risk, and whether that's on payments, has just made the end-to-end -end process more seamless and more magical for the end customer. Um, so I'm curious to, to hear what you have to say there as well. Yeah, so Simon, I don't know if you add anything. Yeah, still here. Sorry, I'm battling Wi-Fi issues. It's so okay. I was I, I was going to come up with another uh, another F word or joke just to sort of keep that theme going, but um, I'm going to go off camera and hope this helps. It's um, certainly so fine. I hope you guys are catching all of this, and uh, typically this happens during a webinar, which is wonderful. Um, so uh, the irony of talking about real time when you can't get real time to a webinar that you're dialing into <laughs> is, is definitely not lost on me. Um, but hopefully the audience is still with us on this. Um, look, frankly, uh, if I'm going to be dealing with real-time payments, then getting before the transaction is as important as possible. A batch process, a slow process is, is just not an option. And uh, thankfully, there are now so many real-time APIs that you can call to be able to build a 360 picture of who that device is, how it's the users behaving, where they've been transacting in the past, um, how that card has behaved before, what we know about it from the telco, what do we know about it from the, what do we know about the email, the history of the email, how recently was it created? If I can pull all of that in real time, I can get you a much more detailed decision about whether you should allow that transaction. And here's the, the compliance side of it. The, a lot of people miss is a lot of things that look like uh, money mule activity or compliance issues or um, giant fraud rings, uh, giant uh, organized crime rings that would typically be investigated by a compliance analyst starts out as fraud. And most organizations historically could not connect the dots between fraud and compliance. They exist in silos. Uh, those things aren't connected. Their transaction monitoring system looks at transactions. It doesn't look at everything around the transaction. So you see all of these emails, all of these manual processes that organizations are working with to try and cover the gaps. And honestly, the we call the fraud squad heroes because, frankly, they are holding up the world economy and they are not given enough credit for the amount of important work they do for society. But they need better tools. Imagine if I had God mode. Imagine if I could see every transaction, uh, every device, everyone that touched us. And then I had a visibility and a network graph to connect all of that picture to do investigations from the compliance standpoint. That's the importance of real time. Unless I can pull that real time data together, unless I can see it in one place visually, unless I can instantly create a case, then I'm fighting fires without any without a, a fire department. It's it's incredibly difficult for those for those folks. Fighting fires without a fire department. I, mm -hmm. I like that. I want to Simon. I want to stay with you for a moment because um, I want to begin just to talk about on and off ramps. And you know, for our audience, I think on an on and off ramp is key to how consumers get money uh, to and from the. The traditional financial system through our rails. So, I sort I would sort of I guess start with asking you, Simon, what sort of risks are associated with an on ramp product? Um, and if you can go in a little bit about the work that Sardine's doing, I, I think that I'd love to hear more. Yeah. So, um, remember when I said uh, all risk problems are data problems? Um, mm -hmm. Most of the risk in financial services starts and ends with crypto. Um, and I say that as somebody who's been an advocate for the transparency, the global 24-7 nature of this technology since I was head of crypto R&D at Barclays in 2015. I fundamentally believe that technology is a great equalizer and it's a wonderful, wonderful product. 
However, it is unfortunately subject to a lot of scams because the payments are entirely irrevocable and they can be operated globally to an anonymous wallet. That creates a massive risk challenge. If you want to real time uh, accept funds from somebody and give them crypto or vice versa, accept crypto and real time give them funds, that is an extremely risky endeavor to be taking place. So the best way to manage that is to have the most data about what's happening in the blockchain network. So we partner with TRM Labs and many of the data providers in that space to get a full real-time visibility of what's happening in crypto. And then you add to that and you layer on the ability to, through our partner in code, get a full view and only do these transactions when somebody's been through full KYC. We get an increasing level of confidence, and this comes to the fast lane, slow lane, on how risky is this user and how much friction should we add whilst they're trying to uh, whilst they're trying to make the payment. And what we found is, since we launched our on-ramp product, Sardine has consistently the highest conversion rate as an on-ramp of any of the other on-ramp providers. And part of the reason for that is we start at risk and we work back to payments rather than starting at payments and working back to risk. Not that that's wrong. It's just where we started. And this one type of payment happens to be extremely risky. So from a sardine perspective, it really allows us to see uh, the entire crypto space and collect data about uh, the old saying is, if you grow up in a bad neighborhood, you might learn a few tricks. Um, we get to really see uh, a few things happening in that space. Uh, that allows us to mature our entire platform. And some of our largest financial institution clients, our largest e-commerce merchants will all tell you that they see crypto as a part of the biggest scams that they're, that they're involved in and that, that uh, impact them on a daily basis. So for us, yes, it's great that we can provide a product that looks like an on-ramp, but for us, it's really about managing the risk that sits around it um, and partnering with folks like CRB and others to, to enable that. No, th thanks, Simon. I think it's it's it was an important distinction you made there, and uh, I'm glad you, you were able to explain that. Uh, Emily, what about you? I mean, we, we, you talked about a little bit about different sort of frauds. You touched a little bit. Give us a little teaser promo on different ways that frauds, you know, fraud typologies can come up. On ramp, on ramps, off ramps. I mean, can you go in a little bit more detail? We touched on a few. I'd love to hear a little bit more um, on where you see the risks. Yeah. Um... I mean, potential the, risks for, for in general, right. For ACH specifically, like no news is good news for on ramps and off ramps. Right. And that's like generally not the best way to operate, especially when, when, when uh, we're sending payments. Um, so I do think there's like a huge opportunity here. Um, when we think through new payment rails of RTP fed now, when we think through how could requests for pay, right, the the new payment rail of, of basically leveraging RTP to, um, to perform an on-ramp transaction, right, how can the new payment rails and the faster payment rails actually help here to reduce risk, given ACH is taking, right, we see two to five days to settle, and then a lot of times there's returns there for, for a variety of reasons. Um, so there are definitely are risks there. We're, we're really focused on, right, how can we create these magical, rem remarkable experiences for the end customer by leveraging innovative rails or by perhaps, right, like Simon uh, mentioned, could we fund an ACH before it settled? Things like that to help create these instant experiences without taking the conception of like, no news is good news with ACH, let's cross our fingers and hope it lands. Um, because generally for the industry, right, we need to think differently and think more innovatively um, to be able to create better product experiences for the for the um, entire industry. Yeah, that's great. So yeah, I, I see questions are coming in and that's that's great. Um, you know, we're going to we're going to try to get to them in, in a second, and make sure everyone's questions answered. Um, but I, I just want to sort of talk more about Simon, if you talk about banks and fintechs and ways that banks and fintechs can partner to minimize risk, save time and thus reduce fraud. You know, I, I think it's it would be valuable for the audience if you could just share a little bit of, of detail. Yeah, so there is a huge visibility gap. Any 
financial institution or fintech company has, and that's everything outside of their four walls. Uh, I can't see what's happening inside of every other company and what their compliance department sees, and I, I probably shouldn't see everything. But there are, but there are times when uh, the well, the, it's really common actually for money launderers to arbitrage that gap. They know that these organisations struggle to communicate and talk to each other, and so for decades, uh, data sharing has been a challenging issue. Um, and there is the Early Warning Services Consortia, which is aiming to uh, sort of solve some of that on the bank account side. But what about other rails? What about wallets like Square? What about wallets like PayPal? What about uh, embedded finance? What about all of the banks outside of the top eight? Um, what about EWS for everybody else? And thankfully, there are a few initiatives in the market to start to look at that. Plaid announced something called Beacon. Uh, Unit 21 has the Unit 21 DAO. Right. Um, DAO, uh, data sharing DAO, forget its name, apologies to everybody involved. And Sardine has something called Sardine X. And um, Sardine X is a 314B uh, registered with FinCEN data sharing utility. Um, and what that allows us to do is operate um, a data sharing peer-to-peer -be -peer between organizations. So where uh, you inquire and spot, um, let's say that um, Emily is sending some money to Benjamin, uh, Emily's uh, fintech company and Benjamin's wallet um, might be able to communicate through Sardine X and share some very sensitive personally identifiable information uh, under this fully regulated compliant environment to be able to see Hang on, um, is Benjamin actually secretly a fraudster that's tricking Emily? Like, this is entirely oh, possible. <laughs> no, okay, I will take your word for it in this example. Um, but what we could do is is build that collective intelligence around the transactions, and I think that's going to be super important. Number one, number two, uh, after building collective intelligence, is uh, partnering with the infrastructure companies. So financial institutions find themselves in a really interesting place where the past decade was really shaped by the fintech versus financial institutions conversation. And I think this decade is really reshaping. Um, what we've seen since companies like Chime and Ramp and Brex and many others have hit enterprise scale is so have their infrastructure partners. Uh, there are now companies that are unicorns, that are multi-billion dollars, that are enterprise grade, enterprise ready, and we are increasingly seeing at Sardine, I'm sure you see it at Orem as well, is that a lot of the financial institutions are becoming some of our most interested clients uh, and they are willing to begin to partner. So there's FinTech, the uh, fraud prevention counterparty and how can you work on data sharing? And then there's FinTech, the supplier who might be different to my incumbent and might help me solve something in a little bit of a different way. So those would be the two, two lenses I start to, to think about partnerships on. So I want to make it a little interactive here. We, we've got some questions coming in. We had, we had some questions uh, that came in earlier before I, I would switch it up because I like to save some time at the end for like my my favorite part of it, each webinar is like, you know, your crystal ball view into the future for our panelists. So Emily, let me just, I'm going to give you a rapid fire right here. Um, questions coming in and says, uh, what are your top recommendations for implementing an ACH broad risk model? Ooh, I would say hire Sardine. No, just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> but, but, but I'm kind of serious. I would say, um, for developers, for founders, don't try and reinvent the wheel, right? Like there are some fintechs out there that are doing some amazing things and, Orem prides ourselves on moving money as safely as possible, right? So if you need to move money, I highly recommend, right, going to Orem, going to some of the fintechs in the in the industry that you can, again, get up and running in two weeks and, and start moving money. If you want to build an ACH risk model, right, again, leverage what's already been done in market. Don't reinvent the wheel until you really need to. So look into starting, look into some of the other providers out there um, until you really feel like you need to build in-house. Um, that would be my advice. I, I think just to build on that, I'd also say run a proof of concept. Um, you know, don't take my word for it that Sardine is the best. Um, you, let data win arguments. 
Um, let's do a back test against how you're running it today, or let's look at your, um, your fraud losses, and let's see what difference we could have made for you. Simon, we're going to keep this rapid fire session Sorry. going. Okay. It, uh, another question from our audience. Um, is there, an, and I'm disclosure, I'm choosing these in no particular order, just, just, just random selection. Is there an opportunity to recall a real-time wire from the sender's side? You would have to get your bank involved with that. So you'd have to um, get the bank involved. Ben, you're probably the best one, <laughs> one to answer that. Um, and right. then it's on the bank side, right? And it's really their responsibility to recall it. There's no automated way to recall that. Great. So uh, I got another one, which is interesting. When, when you're building a, a you know a, a team, are the recommendations around what your minimum team um, should be for a fintech who's launching a, a, a like a neo bank through a BAS um, program? Like, what what should people be thinking about? I think is the question. I'm translating um, in a way. What, how should you be structuring a team? I guess Emily, I'll I'll give it. And and what are you seeing from your partners and how they're doing that? I'll I'll throw that to you, Emily. Yeah, I would say um, I wouldn't over index on bringing on payments experts again, because there are so many payment experts in the industry. Some customers do bring us that question and it's like, focus on your product, make your product best in class and let us do the hard work, right? So if you have payments questions, compliance questions, if you are thinking about regulatory questions or concerns, really leverage your partners and fintechs in the space and the experts in the space. Um, we always will sit down with customers and talk through compliance flows and like happy to do so. We have the, the payments experts, so you don't need to be one. You be the expert in whatever product you're building. Um, so for the team, you know, again, I, I would really leverage your, your partners in, in the space and um, not hire right your director of compliance, et cetera, too early because we have a great director of compliance, Rich, who would um, gladly talk to you. So that would be my advice. Just focus on building the best possible product um, and leverage your network and resources and partners in the space. And, and, and just to build on that, I think the thing we've seen is uh, we have clients that run the gamut that have teams of 30 um, 40, we've, come, we've got a couple of clients that, you know, get up into the hundreds when it's on the financial institution side. Uh, but what we also see is uh, people who uh, have a head of payments who's by night is the head of fraud and the head of compliance. And, and when you're super early stage, that's reality. Everybody has 10 jobs. And so uh, in that space, we do, again, similarly to what Emily was talking about, we do a lot of handholding, a lot of education, um, but we also like to think of ourselves genuinely as the uh, fraud and compliance team you hire as an API. When you're buying from Sardine, you're buying our team. You're buying the fact that we're also in there, we're spotting the fraud patterns, we're, we're trying to help you adjust your rule sets, we're trying to adjust your modeling so that you're reducing your fraud. We have um, a neobank with uh, with thousands of cards issued that has a full time team of two, um, and yes, they have some offshore staff and some agency, um, but they were able to automate with Sardine um, nearly everything. Um, and there are still things going for manual review. There are still things that they're looking at, um, but you can be wildly efficient if you want to. A lot of it comes down to your risk appetite and your risk profile. And that unfortunately varies by what product you're launching, to who, um, at what kind of scale, with what kind of marketing budget. Um, so it's, there's not really um, a one size fits all answer to that question, but generally uh, somebody out, out there has solved this problem before. Uh, there is no downside to figuring out who that is um, and playing to your strengths. Emily, I think that was such a good point. It's like, what am I great at as a company? Where do I want to go succeed? Because uh, you can always build down the stack later for unit economics if you're really great at that. Like that's always an option if you build in the right way. Um, but I think the market cycle has taught us one thing recently, which is uh, you can build it yourself, but can you maintain it? <laughs> uh, it's one thing to have the CapEx spend to go build a feature, it's another thing to maintain that and still be trying to build new features over the top of it. So, you know, th this is a trade-off um, and not there isn't one size fits all. Yep. So uh, 
I'm going to take one more, and then we're going to go back to my sort of glimpse into the future. I'd love to hear from you both. I have some some questions I'd love to an, to ask you, and then we'll try to uh, address some of the remaining questions from from some of our attendees. But uh, this is this is for both of you, so I thought it'd be a good way to pivot back. I'd love to hear both of your perspectives. It's uh, hi Emily and Simon. It seems an important signal for fraud models is device information. For typical payment authorized via ORAMs, Emily. How is device level data captured and correlated against data inputs to conduct a fraud check? I'll let Simon take it that first, then I'll or I'll, yeah, I'll go back. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Go ahead, Simon. Yeah, just battling some Wi-Fi issues. Hopefully you guys yeah. have got loud and clear. Um, so uh more data is good. All right, so um, I would be looking at the user. I'd be looking at, um, are, the, uh, are they using static IPs? How many payment methods does that user have? What is the age of that account? Um, num device, how many regions has that device been to recently? Is there something weird with the operating system on that device? Um, is that device using a proxy? Um, what do I know about the behavior? Are they copying and pasting when they're um, onboarding to an account? Are they copying and pasting account details that they're paying to? That's weird. Um, so there's all of these little things that start to look really odd. Um, is the person they're paying got an identity mismatch with the owner? They're trying to pay uh, John Doe, but it's actually Benjamin's account. That's weird. Um, what's the risk level of the, um, the recipient bank they're sending it to? because we all know that one big bank that has a lot of issues. And so there's all of these reputation things you can start to build up around the transaction, around the device and, and kind of around the behavior. Uh, the reality is there isn't one particular signal that we look for. Uh, we, it's very contextual to the transaction, to the user, to the time, to the point in time. So uh, what you really, what we say at Sardine is we have uh, about 700 rules out of the box from things we've seen before. The trick then is uh, adjusting those over time to your risk profile. Because again, like I can give you generic advice about how to do that, which is you know, implement these 500 rules, implement this velocity check, implement this type of um, static IP check, implement the, the, that's just all gonna come out of the box and that's just the good advice. But if you're an e-commerce merchant or if you're uh, in a, launching a peer-to-peer -peer wallet, you're going to have very different types of uh, needs for what you're looking at from your device. And so you, the ability to adjust that over time and then the ability to uh, sort of backtest that. So if you if we come up with five new roles, five new uh, a new machine learned model, uh, the model, uh, we want to regression test that. We want to backtest it. We might want to run it side by side or what we call in shadow mode with the with the existing models to see what does that do to your decline rate? What is that doing to your uh, to your real performance? And so, again, it's it really is getting nerdy about data is, is kind of what we love to do. Uh, and so, yes, you want to get as many signals as you can about the device and the behavior because that's gonna be so, so crucial to you. But then how you set up and implement that is really, there are the basics to get right. And then around that, it's tailoring it to your specific risk profile. Great. So Emily, did you have anything you wanna add or? I think the only thing I would add, I uh, echo Simon, all, more data, the better. I think um, one aspect of data that we use at Forum that, that tends to help is if we've seen, like across all of our customers, if we've seen transactions fail to one particular person or one particular account routing multiple times, we can leverage that data to kind of clue others in on like this, like something's wrong with this account or there's been fraud here, et cetera. So all the more data, the better. Um, and then we do leverage like some of our core transaction data to also help our customers out. Um, but device data, any, any data will definitely help um, to Simon's point. Hearing a lot about data today and the importance of data. So I think that, that yeah, point... and, and open banking, right? Like that's um, an underrated one, but consortia, um, you want to get uh, EWS is out there. You want to be looking at the history of the email. So there are e data providers on the email history. How old is this email account? Because if it's just been created, hmm, that's strange. Uh, why would you suddenly use an account that's just been created on for 
to be transacting. Uh, you, the uh, telco, uh, telcos know a lot about mobile phone numbers. How recently was that created? There's an amazing richness that you can get uh, once you know where to look. And I think that's kind of the function Sardine plays in the market is knowing where to look. Great. So I want to pivot back. Uh, we're taking a look into the future. We've talked a lot about fraud. Both of you have, uh, and your companies clearly are at the forefront of this topic. Uh, so what advice do you have for someone who wants to build a tech stack um, in financial services and that needs to address fraud? It's, it's another grand question, but Emily, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask you to go first. Advice. Okay. Tips, yeah. pointers. I'll um, kind of repeat what I said at the beginning. Right. I would say start small, start with your MVP. You fully, fully focus on your product. Don't overcomplicate anything and really leverage the experts in the market. Um, I think Simon said it well, like we're sort of like an extension of, of companies, right? So really don't overcomplicate, take baby steps when you need to add complexity, but start, start small and leverage companies who have kind of, um, done this and, and don't reinvent the wheel. Um, I think the other thing I would advise is don't wait until you have a big fraud event to implement fraud controls. So yeah, how yeah. How can you be proactive? How can you work with partners in market to put any sort of rules, any sort of, you know, tiny bits of um, protection for you so that you're thinking about fraud and risk and compliance before you have a massive um, fraud event? I think Steph, our, our CEO, and I think Soups as well, calls it the, the fraud tax, right? How can we all try to prevent the fraud tax that does happen to a lot of companies um, and just be really proactive in that thinking. Don't wait, um, but you don't need to reinvent the wheel. Like call any of us and we're all happy to help. And, and I think just on that, um, it was uh, Shamir who on stage with both Soups and um, Stephanie at DevCon last year said, uh, you know, somebody asked him the question, when did you realize you had a fraud problem? And he said, uh, when $340,000 was missing and I didn't know why. Um, and it, it turns out most fraud comes from people that are fully registered, fully verified identities, because guess what? Stolen identities and fraudsters are good at faking identities and so on. So don't think that because you've done the tick box process, you're going to solve fraud and not lose money. And then you end up in this thing called the Visa chargeback program or the MasterCard chargeback program, which is so many people have been victims of fraud. They start pressing this button to try and deal with a call to chargeback. And you're like, oh my goodness, I might get kicked off of Visa and MasterCard, my bank's sort of breathing down my neck, what's going on here? And you, all of that could have been prevented. Uh, honestly, those programs are the best business development tool Sardine has. And I don't want that to be the case anymore. I, I want it to be the case that we do so much education um, and that we do so much founder focused content that you just bake this right in. And ultimately, how should you build a tech stack is like, how should you think about your mental health and fitness? The answer sort of depends on you. But uh, my belief is do what you're great at, especially early stage, do things that don't scale and then use other people for everything that you need to scale. Like, And then you always have the optionality later if you build it the right way to, to move that out. If you've got the, the tech lead that wants to build it all. Um, my one of my other favorite sayings a mentor said to me how do you know you're talking to an engineer um, which is the answer to which is if you ask them a question they go oh I could build that <laughs> and that is the temptation of course they probably could if they just had enough time the problem with being a young company is uh, time is money and there's not always a lot of money and wasting time is existential so what are you going to do to get in market prove value to your customer and start to grow. And I think that's where partners can really help you. So here we go. Uh, the future. The land. I, I want to I hear from both of you on this one. So if you can, um, is just real quickly, where are we going? What's the regulatory landscape look like in 2024 or beyond? We, we, we see new, again, you know, uh, fraud topologies every day. There's new, new emerging technologies. I think about AI. You know, what are you both see 
or predict that we should all be thinking about that's to come. Um, and, and I'm just, it's more of a, a personal curiosity than anything else. I'd, I'd love to hear your perspectives. Emily. Yeah, I can, I can uh, kick off. I don't have a crystal ball into the regulatory aspect. However, I have a slight crystal ball into the payment innovation aspect of this. And I think the, with FedNow coming online and as FedNow and RTP continue to gain coverage in market, I think what's super interesting and what Orem's really focused on is the interoperability between the two, right? So how are we moving money as fast as possible between those two rails? What's the logic behind it, right? How do we route a transaction to a FedNow eligible account? But what if the bank is down? Okay, let's route to RTP or wire. And I think like that engine and that logic is going to become really, really interesting and important as we um, gain coverage on all the instant payment rails. So that's something we're really excited about. It's a huge opportunity for innovation, right? Um, geared towards orchestrating payments across the different systems. Yeah, I, I don't know where to begin really on the, the regulation. <laughs> I had a feeling you were gonna say that, Simon, but it's, it's okay. <laughs> oh, um, so uh, there's a, a guy on Twitter, Tom Noyes, a famous payments blogger, um, Put out a poll. Um, will will there be a, a dog Frank two uh, inside the next five years? And ninety five percent of the audience said no. Um, I think just legislation is is looking unlikely in financial services um, in the United States. However, regulation and enforcement actions quite the opposite, especially in the current administration. So what you're seeing is. Um, you know, sort of the, the three federal agencies issuing guidance in the wake of the banking crisis around partnerships and uh, how, how that should operate. This is a, uh, a meaningfully different environment than it was two years ago. Um, the one of my uh, taglines is payments are easy, edge cases are hard and everything is edge cases. So what you need to do is start at compliance and work backwards. You have to have that mindset all the way through everything you're doing. And if you are innovating, then you want to do that. Uh, I think the innovation in this space is, uh, you know, frankly, uh, the fraudsters are the first to use Gen AI. Um, we're already seeing them use deep fakes to um, pass compliance checks onboarding. We're already seeing them use deep fakes to uh, fake people's voice into scamming parents and uh, losing money in, in that space. Um, but it's going to take AI to catch AI. And if we have better AI, we'll be able to catch more of it too. So that excites me. Um, and what I'm excited by beyond that is uh, you can't keep innovation down. We are going to see, I think, a wave of new fintech companies uh, attacking a very different market than we've had. We have long-term low interest rates for nearly uh, two decades. Now we're in a high interest rate environment. We're in a market where buying a house is a lot harder. We're in a market where a generation of people might not have the same opportunities that the, their parents did. This is the space for innovators to do new things in payments and in FinTech more broadly. That's hugely exciting. So I know we're at, thanks Simon, and thank you, Emily. I, no, we're at the top of the hour, uh, so I want to thank um, our audience for dialing in uh, and joining us today. And especially, I want to thank particularly Emily and Simon for joining, sharing your perspectives. Uh, I would encourage you, our email uh, addresses are in the in the box. You can, if you have further questions, apologies for not getting to all of your questions. Um, but, you know, tune in, stay tuned uh, to, the, to the next webinar in Cross Rivers Investor Payment Series. And uh, thank you for attending today.